Hey everybody, this is Pierre Quinn and you're listening to the Leading Wild Green podcast where my mission is to help you live, learn, and lead with confidence. On episode number eight, we're going to talk about the importance of picking a lane, why you need to stop pretending like you have options, a challenge to put up some numbers, a reminder of the importance of charting a course, and why size shouldn't matter. So... Listen up. One of the things that I learned early on about really choosing which direction that you want to go is that you're always going to be tempted to do more than one thing. Now, now let's, let's put this in context when it relates to leadership, when it relates to entrepreneurship, when it relates to projects or plans, there are times when people who are really talented can end up getting pulled in multiple directions. And that's very, very dangerous. Uh, There's a book out called Essentialism, the Discipline Pursuit of Less. And I'll, I'll put that in the show notes. And the author of Essentialism talks about how when you're trying to go in multiple directions, you can you can move an inch or two in each of those multiple directions, or you can set a set a course for one direction and put everything behind going in that one direction. And you'll find much more success and much more, much more progress. So when I was in the seminary, when I was studying to be a pastor, I had multiple jobs. I was teaching communication courses at two schools. I was working as a part time graphic designer at the at the print shop on campus. And I was doing some freelance graphic design work on on the side. I was I was connected with one of these freelance websites at the time. It was called Odesk.com. It has since changed its name to Upwork.com. And I was a freelancer on Upwork doing graphic design and doing PowerPoint and keynote presentations. And I developed a pretty good system. I was I was pretty decent at it. And it would bring me in a couple of hundred dollars nearly every week. And that, that was a big help because I'm in school and have a wife, got two kids, traveling, trying to put foot on the table, trying to get through seminary courses, taking 16 graduate credits and having these part time jobs that don't pay a lot, but pay just enough for us to meet ends sometimes. Well, the the graphic design portion, the freelance graphic design portion of my life had picked up a little bit and it was a steady stream of income. And I was continuing this graphic design work even after I graduated from seminary and we moved to Kentucky. I still had these graphic design projects on the side. And and one project that that I picked up was for a fairly prominent entrepreneur and motivational success speaker. She she would hold these summits and you would have to spend several hundred dollars to come to these summits, to come to these trainings. And she was really popular. She had a huge following and she was paying me several hundred dollars to produce, to produce these, these keynote presentations for her, her three, four day trainings. And it was good work. It was easy work. I could turn them around in a couple of days. And, and that was, that was a good boost to, to the income that was bringing into our house at the time. But then something happened around, I want to say 2015. Around 2015, I really got serious about about reining in all of my other aspirations and activities. And I really wanted to put some 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 emphasis behind this this speaker thing, this leadership speaker thing. I was finishing up my book, Leading Wild Green. I was starting to get phone calls from organizations and from churches to come in and and train with train their leaders and work with their leaders and speak to their churches and speak to their team. So that was picking up. But it was it was it wasn't as consistent as as I wanted it to be. And I was using these freelance projects, this PowerPoint work, this keynote work, this design work to supplement my, my family's income. 
But then I got to the point where I just said, you know, I don't want to do this anymore. Uh, don't get me wrong. I like the money that comes from it. I like I like having the income. When I started school, I started as a graphic design major because I loved art and I loved to draw and I was interested in computers. But I left graphic design, but but I was pretty much self-taught. I taught myself the program at the time was PageMaker and I taught myself how to use PageMaker. And through teaching myself how to use PageMaker, I was able to get a job at the print shop with the graphic designers on campus. And they 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 gave me a crash course, a crash course in graphic design. So so I wasn't formally taught, but I developed an eye and a knack for design and for colors. And I was doing well, but I got to the point, it's 2015, said, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to put all of my energies behind all of my all of my leftover energies or all of the energies that I could spare. I wanted to put it behind this speaking, developing a speaking career, full time pastor, working with with multiple congregations, but I wanted to put some emphasis behind the speaking thing. And I said, in order to do that, I'm going to have to stop these side projects because it's taking away time and taking away energy. And I remember getting an email from the assistant for this popular speaker. And I said, I respond, ask the email was asking me, could I work on the presentation again this year? And I told them, my response was, you know, I'm transitioning to to a speaking career of my own. And because I want to focus on that, I won't be able to spend time doing your presentations. I can help you find someone, but but our, our time working together in this capacity has come to an end. And they offered me the assistant offered me uh, free admission to this speaker's next training course, live training course. I couldn't make it. It was in Orlando at the time. I would have loved to have gone, but I couldn't make it. But I just I just it was refreshing knowing that I was focusing my time and attention towards something that I really wanted to do. Now, the difficulty is after that, you know, the the speaking engagements that I was using to supplement my household income were not coming as consistently as I wanted them to. And there were several times along the way I said to myself, you know what? Go back to this person, go back to your graphic design projects, go back to your PowerPoints and keynotes, go back. And there were a couple of times where I think I tried to and it didn't work out. But but I went back to my resolve and I said, you know what? No, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to focus on this. I'm going to focus on this speaking. I'm going to focus on promoting my book, Leading While Green, and I'm going to put everything that I have into it. And And now it's roughly two years later. We're about two years later because I published Leading While Green around October 2015. That's October 2017. Two years later and and ups and downs and frustrations. But two years later, the momentum that I started to build back then is now really starting to pick up with with the speaking engagements, with the trainings in with church groups, with faith based organizations and corporate environments at conferences around this content that I wrote two years ago. And that just that just shows me and it shows you the importance of just sticking with it. A lot of things don't turn out for us because we don't stick with it or because we keep too many options open. And I had to cut off the option of graphic design. I had to cut off the option of doing keynotes and PowerPoints. I had to cut off those options. I even cut out teaching because I was teaching at, at at a school in Kentucky, teaching business communication courses. I said I had to cut that out and focus. And now two years later, I see the snowball getting bigger and the momentum starting to build. But some of the challenges that we face in life, if you're an entrepreneur, if you lead in a corporate environment, if you lead in a church, if you lead in a nonprofit, is that we keep too many options open. And we 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 sometimes tell people that we can do more things. Now we have the the ability to do it, but we don't have the capacity and the capacity puts us in a space where in the book essentialism, we're going, we're moving one inch in 13 different directions. So ask yourself as it relates to your goals and your dreams, as it relates to your family, as it relates to your business, as it relates to your projects, what are some of the things that you may even be good at? You may be, maybe even enjoy them, but you got to let them go. You got to cut them off. You got to reduce so that you can focus on on the things that really touch your heart and focus on the the specific area of your calling. It's it's almost like the experience of I was in the bank the other day 
or similar experience when I'm in Walmart. And when you're in the bank, you see all of these windows. You see all of these windows, but you only see three tellers at the window. Or you go to Walmart, you see 352 checkout lanes, but only four people who are working as cashiers. And then they have the you scan thing open. But, but there's, but, but there's long lines because it seems like you have, it seems like the organization, like the bank or like the grocery store or, or like Walmart, it seems like they're presenting you with options, but they're not, they're not opening those options up to you. And sometimes I get frustrated and say, well, if you're never going to open those options, why do you even put the lanes there? Why do you even put the windows there? Why are you pretending like you're go- like you, like you can offer me something? Why do you pretend like you're going to offer me something one day, but you never, you never give it to me? And we do that. We, we, we call, we, we, we say we can do multiple things. I'll work on the presentation. I'll work on bringing the team together. I'll cook the food. I'll coordinate the volunteers. I'll look over the press release. I'll make sure the speaker is taken care of and, and, and all of their needs are being met. I'll make and I'll do every it's almost like in college or in high school when you work on group projects and you have that person that wants to do everything because it ensures that they get it, that they get an A. And that works out fine if you just lag on on the team. It it works out fine that everybody put the projects together or the one person put the project together and they give you your part and you say your two or three lines and everybody gets an A. That's fine. But it's it's. It's really not fine. And I hate it seeing that as a as a college professor. But what's even more frustrating, the person who takes all of those responsibilities onto themselves and then that person has a breakdown or that person can't do it or that person can't follow through. And you set yourself up for failure because you didn't focus. Maybe you should have just focused on doing the PowerPoint presentation and called everybody else to task on their on their responsibilities. Stop having all of these windows open. And then when people come, they come to these open windows and you say you can't help them or you try to help them and it doesn't work out. So some things you just got to cut off. You got to shut down. You could be good at them. You could like them, but somebody else could do them. Or you're trying to you're trying to work, write your book. You're trying to write your book at at the same time, and then you're trying to help somebody else edit their book, and then you're trying to work on this project, and then you're trying to get the meeting together. You can't do everything at once. You're going to burn yourself out. And some of the things, and and some of the things that you're doing, you should not do them. There are other people who can do them, so you can be laser focused on the stuff that you only you can do. It hurt cutting off that extra income from graphic design. It hurt stopping that extra income from teaching. But it allowed me to be laser focused on 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 this whole leadership thing that I'm really passionate about. And now two years later, it's beginning to take off and go in the direction that I hoped it go. I I wished it would go in the beginning. But things take time. It takes time to chart a course. It takes time to 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 get the, the strength and the energy and the belief to go in the direction to actually walk in the direction or in the confidence of your God-given calling. It it takes time to do that. And here's what I'm learning. I'm learning that in my life, I'm a trailblazer of sorts because I'll try something, I'll experiment, I'll get bumps and bruises. And because I have the courage to try, there are people who come along after me and go, they go beyond what I was able to accomplish, but it 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 was getting my feet wet getting my feet wet first, taking the chance first that allowed them to develop the confidence and, and just the belief that they could do it too. And charting a course is not, it's not always easy. It's not easy at all. I I was in the parking lot of Walmart and this is not a Walmart themed podcast today, but I was in the parking lot of Walmart one morning with my wife and we saw the van. We saw one of the vans that they use to make the maps for the GPS app on your phone. Oh, this was an Apple van. It had the California license plate. It had all kinds of gadgets and gizmos on the top of the van that were spinning. It it was white and said Apple on the side and Apple. I think it said Apple maps on the side. 
and you knew that was the van that took those pictures that charted the course. You ever look on maps and you and you ask yourself, how can they have a picture? And some of you look at your house and you see your car in the driveway. How can they have that picture? How can they have that picture? Well, part of the reason they can have that picture is because they send these vans across the country to take these pictures, to record these videos, to track this course so that when you put the coordinates or you put an address in your GPS, you are literally following a path that somebody else has driven before. You're literally following a path that the Apple van or the Google Maps car has driven before you and they can show you the picture of your destination because for the most part, they've already driven there. And you can rest assured because you see the picture and you see where you're supposed to turn and you know how long the distance, how long the distance is. And you know the time that it will take for you to get there. But you only know those things because someone has charted that course. And in many of our lives and for many of us on this podcast who are listening today, you are called to chart courses. Now, charting courses is not easy. I remember going to Ruby Falls in Tennessee. And they were telling the story of the cave system around Ruby Falls and how some of the first explorers charted the court. They they had to crawl in on their backs. They crawled in on their stomachs and it was completely dark. But through by crawling through the caves, they were able to create a map for cave exploration. But somebody had to be first. Somebody had to take the chance. Somebody had to go in the dark. Somebody had to go and create a way where no way was made before. And it could be that in your life, you are called to make a way. You're called to chart the course. And once you chart the course, then other people can set their GPS coordinates coordinates to the course you've already charted. And they can find their way safely to their destination because you've gone before them. So rise to the challenge. Hey, you may be the only person, the first person in in your family to start the business. You may be the only person in your family to have a leadership role in your church or in your faith community. You may be the only person to to finish the college, to do the four year, the, the master's, the graduate degree. You may be the only person, but there are tons of individuals who are looking at you. And that's what good leadership is about. There are tons of individuals who are looking at you and based on your perseverance and based on your success, they will develop the confidence in their lives to live up to their God given calling the same way that you're living up to yours. But you got to you got to you got to chart that course first. So this is baseball season, baseball playoff season. It's football season. It's preseason basketball. It's it's hockey season. And all these things are happening at, at the same time for the sports enthusiasts. They're having an incredible time. And I was going to a Washington Nationals game because I live in the D.C. area. I was going to a Washington Nationals game and I was riding the Metro and I was listening to two people on the train talk about the stats of the players for the nationals. They were talking about batting averages and they were talking about home runs and on base percentages. And baseball is not really my top sport, but I I know enough to stick in a conversation if somebody's talking about baseball, but they were talking about all of these things. And I, and I, and I heard one of the, the guys talking, just rattle off all of these stats. And he was going back years and years and years and years and years talking about stats of all of these players over the years. And and I asked myself, I said, man, how many times am, have I been guilty over the years of tracking the stats of other people? I'm tracking the stats of my favorite athletes. Basketball is probably my favorite sport. Tracking the stats of my favorite basketball players. Or even with other people who I know, I'm tracking the stats of where they go and the positions they have and the trips that they go on and the influence that they have and the things that they do and the the goals that they're able to accomplish. I find myself stat tracking. I'm tra- I know their moves. I, I know the places they've been. I know where they go to speak. I know where they go on vacation. I know how they spend their money. I know what they say about particular topics. I'm, I'm tracking their stats. But how many times have I been so guilty of tracking the stats of other people that I haven't put up any numbers of my own? And that's a big challenge for you. 
you're listening to this and you've been tracking the stats of other people, you know what other people do, you know where they go, you know where they shop, you know what they buy, you know the trips, you know the things that they speak at, you know the programs they start, you're tracking, tracking, critiquing and tracking and tracking and keeping track of everything that they do, but you're not putting up numbers of your own. And I want to challenge you, especially this is the fourth quarter. This is the last quarter of the year. This is October. You only got a few weeks left to really make a difference and really make a dent in the goals that you set at the beginning of the year. But the only reason you're going to do the only way you're going to do that is if you stop tracking the stats of other people and put up some numbers for for yourself. Work towards your goals for yourself. Set a schedule for yourself. Keep keep pushing. I'm t- I'm talking to you about two years later, two years later after I published Leading Wild Green. Now the calls are starting to come in. Now the emails are starting to come in. Now the requests are starting to come in uh, about having me come to present to different groups about this book and about some other principles of leadership that I've studied and discovered along the way. Two years later, two years of of emailing people, 100, 500, 1,000 people a month, 1,000 schools a month, 1,000 high schools a month, 1,000 nonprofits a month, getting emails back. Who are you? Or we're not interested at the time, or we can't afford you, or doesn't fit our schedule. All of those rejections. And then watching people do the thing that I want to do and sometimes feeling that I'm better at them, but they are where they are because of consistency. And they're not tracking my stats or stats of other influencers. They're sticking with it and putting up numbers of their own. And eventually those numbers add up and eventually your, your averages increase. And I want to challenge you to stop, stop stat tracking so much, cut off social media, stop scrolling so much, stop comparing so much and put up your own numbers. And make a difference. Make a huge difference. And you should be prepared to make a difference no matter the size of the crowd, no matter the audience. Doesn't matter if just one or two people are reading your blog post, keep doing it. Doesn't matter if only a handful of people are watching your videos, keep doing it. Doesn't matter if you only get a handful of volunteers for your ministry project, keep doing it. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. Keep making a difference. Because the numbers eventually, the numbers add up. Now, I was speaking uh, this week at the Maryland Nonprofit Association Conference in Baltimore. And they said on the promotional material, it was about 450 people would be registered for this event. And when I got the email from the coordinator, the event coordinator, they said, prepare for 30 to 40, possibly 30 to 40 people to attend your session. And I was doing a session on my book, Leading Wild Green, How Emerging Leaders Can Ripen Into Effective Leaders. And I was doing a half day session. I would do an hour and a half starting at eight in the morning. And then there would be a break for a main session in the, in the ballroom. And then I would come back after that main session and do another hour and a half. I was doing three hours of teaching, three hours of content. And here, here's a side note. Listen, get your stuff ready before the phone call comes. Get your stuff ready before the request comes. Get your stuff ready before the event and opportunity comes so you want, so you don't have to scramble. And I didn't have to scramble for this because this is content that I've been working on for the past couple of years. So the coordinator said, expect 30 to 40 people in your session. And I said, I'm going to go big. I'm going to go bold. I'm going to make enough materials for a hundred people. I just believe that I'm going to have a hundred people when they, when they read the abstract, when they hear, when they hear about the program, when they go on the social media, when they check out the book, I know I'm going to have a hundred people in my session. I didn't have a hundred people in my session. I didn't have 75 people. Nope. There were not 50 people in my session. There were not 40 people in my session. There were not 25 people in my session. I had 12. Yep. I had 12. Now I've spoken in rooms, I've spoken at conferences with upwards of five, six, seven hundred people. I've given breakout sessions at conferences, not the main speaker, but breakout sessions in upwards of a hundred and two hundred people. Uh, so, so, so I can, I can do this thing. I've been doing this for years, but, but in my, in this session with this content, been looking forward to this conference all year. There were 12 people in the room. When it's 12 people in a room, you got an option. 
Do I dumb this thing, thing down? Do I pull this thing back? Or do I do I give them everything that I got? Now, I wouldn't present exactly the same way at, with a room full of people that I do with 12. But I said, I'm going to give them the same intentionality, the same passion, the same interest as I would give a crowd or a group of 100 to 200, 500, 1,000 people. I'm going to give them everything I got because si- because the size of the crowd should not dictate how intentional I am about teaching the things that I really believe in my heart. And if size matters to you in terms of impact, if you're frustrated that only one or two people are paying attention to what you're going to do, what you're doing, then you will never get to the stage. You will never get to the audience. You will never get to the impact. You'll never get to the place where you're leading a team of over a hundred. If you can't be okay with leading the team of five or 10, you'll never get to a place where, where thousands of people read your work. If you're not content with four or five people reading your work and you're putting out that work on a consistent basis. You'll never get to the point where where you're having influence over thousands or tens of thousands if you can't appreciate having influence over just a few, just a few dozen. And you got to give you got to give it all you got. Those opportunities actually build and it was nothing. It did not bruise my ego. I wasn't upset that there was only a room of, of 12 people. Because I know, I know a couple of things. One, one word gets around and people will say, well, there are only four of us in the room and you could tell the speaker just checked out. No word gets around. Uh, Quinn was in that room. It was 12 of us, but, but man, it was a great session and he gave us everything, everything that he had. And I walked away. I walked away full. I walked away with resources. I walked away with insight. People talk. The other thing is you never know who those 12 people are connected to. You never know who those 12 people are connected to and that somebody in that room of 12 can be the gatekeeper of the or the leverage point to to the audience of a thousand or 10,000. And because of how you treated them in that room of 12. Makes them choose whether or not they're going to introduce you to this next opportunity. So don't so. Don't be thrown off by the size of the crowd, the size of the church, the size of the nonprofit, the size of the ministry, the size of the people in the audience. Don't be thrown off by that at all. Commit yourself to doing an excellent job, no matter the size of the crowd. And a commitment to excellence is one of the things that we're going to talk about at the Revision Conference, October 29th, Baltimore, Maryland. Listen, I need you to sign up. Revision2017.eventbrite.com. Promo code October is still available for you. I need you to sign up. Hey, if you need, if you got a whole group and you need a bigger discount, email me on my website, prcquinn.com. And hey, I need some reviews on iTunes. Need some reviews on iTunes. Love the reviews. Appreciate the reviews and the reviews actually help me get my message out to more people. So I know you've been listening. I've seen your comments on social media. You've been paying attention. You've been taking notes. It's been making a difference. Help me out. Help me out by leaving me a five-star review on iTunes and tell your family and your friends and your neighbors to check this out too, because I'm in this. This is why I'm here. I'm here to help you. I'm here to help your team. I'm here to help the people that you care about. Develop the skills and acquire the resources that will help everybody live, learn, and lead with confidence. So until next time, take care and God bless.